welcome to the first program of the fall at the Overby Center for Southern Journalism and Politics. Um, this is our 11th year, hard to believe, uh, Charles. Uh, our chairman, Charles Overby, and his wife, Andrea, here. Uh, and um, uh, th this year, 2017, we put special emphasis on uh, programs that involve uh, Mississippi because uh, this is uh, the 200th anniversary of our statehood. Uh, before I introduce our guests today, the two points I want to make. One is that there will be a reception outside in the lobby after the program. I hope you'll join us. And then secondly, just to call to your attention, our next program here will be two weeks from today, October 10th. Uh, that program will be at 5.30 and it will feature uh, another, well, uh, Charles Eagles is a new former member of the Ole Miss faculty, a history professor who has a very good new book out uh, called uh, Civil Rights Culture Wars, and it's about an interesting tussle we had here over a school textbook uh, some years ago. Uh, today we have a very excellent uh, uh, subject for uh, our start, and it's going to be a program built around a book by uh, our colleague uh, Kathleen Wickham, professor of journalism at the Meek School. We believed we were immortal. Um, Kathleen's arranged uh, there'll be books for sale outside uh, afterwards at the reception if anybody wants to uh, get a copy. Um, the book deals with uh, a, a a fresh aspect of uh, the crisis we had here on this campus 55 years ago this week. And that was uh, all of the excitement around the attempt by a black man, James Meredith, to become uh, a student here at Ole Miss, efforts by state government to prevent him, and an enormous constitutional confrontation between uh, the federal government and the state of Mississippi. It was so big that it attracted worldwide attention and a press corps from all over, all around the world were here on the campus. I think uh, two or 300 reporters all together were here at one time or another covering it. And um, uh, Kathleen has talked about the role of the press and that's an area that nobody is really uh, uh, dealt with extensively. I should also say that uh, over the years, uh, Kathleen's been very diligent about making sure that we don't forget the death of Paul Guillard, who was a French reporter who was killed here that night and uh, was the only journalist uh, who died during the entire civil rights movement that essentially spanned the uh, 1960s. Um, Joining Kathleen, who's obviously in the middle uh, on our program, will be at my far left, uh, our assistant provost and our longtime friend, Don Cole. Uh -huh. Don, glad to have you here. And yeah. closer and and also still to my left, I think it's important <laughs> to note. On some issues. Our friend and neighbor at the Sally McDonald uh, Barksdale Honors College, uh, uh, the Dean of the Honors College, uh, Doug Sullivan Gonzalez. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to them, but to get it started, we're going to have a short film uh, prepared by uh, Mickey Newton, who has been uh, lending her expertise to all our programs here, really since the inception of the Overby Center. So. Mickey, if you're ready to roll it, we'll get started with you, and then we'll uh, yes. segue to our guests. Thank you all for coming.
James H. Meredith is formally enrolled at the University of Mississippi, ending one chapter in the federal government's efforts to desegregate the university. We did not know uh, how far the movement would go, or where it would go, or whether it would end, or if so, how it would end. Uh, we certainly didn't know what our role in it would be. Uh, I guess a lot of this was because, for some strange reason, most of us were younger then than we are now, and, and we believed that we were immortal and therefore nothing bad could happen to us. Fred Pallage of the Atlanta Journal was not alone in that sentiment the night of September 30th, 1962. The state's political leadership had thrown its might against James Meredith as he sought to become the first African American to integrate the state's flagship university. More than 300 reporters answered the call to duty as protesters descended on the campus of the University of Mississippi. The reporters were attacked, shot at, and their equipment was destroyed. French reporter Paul Gouhard was killed. Texas broadcaster Gordon Yoder was attacked by the mob, but not until he filmed these images. The town of Oxford is an armed camp following riots that accompany the registration of the first Negro in the university's 118-year history. CBS reporter Dan Rather was among those reporters at the scene covering his first national story. More than 300 helmeted United States Marshals climaxed fast-moving events of the afternoon when they poured out of twin-engine transport planes on the tiny Oxford landing strip. And the pictures uh, out of Ole Miss and Oxford at the time of this uh, insurrection, uh, and I use the word measuredly, spoke for themselves. With this you know, kind of ninth circle of Dante's hell is what it looked like and sounded like. Tear gas, gunshots, first sort of sounded like pistol shots, then maybe 22 rifle shots, then shotgun shots. No man, however prominent or powerful, and no mob, however unruly or boisterous, is entitled to defy a court of law. President Kennedy called out the army to restore order. Students woke up to the smell of tear gas and a campus littered by burned out vehicles. James Meredith was registered at 8 a.m. that morning. After getting their wounds treated and calling in their stories, the reporters returned to campus to serve witness to history. Paul Gouhard did not. He remains the only reporter killed during the years of the civil rights movement. He was murdered, shot in the back from a foot away. Paul Guillard worked in, the New York, uh, in New York for Agence France Press, the French news agency. He got the weekend assignment because of short staffing in the office. Guillard, who held dual British and French citizenships, was a young but experienced reporter. He'd been working for the agency since he was 19 when he helped cover the Olympics. He served in the British Army for a time in England and in Egypt as the Suez Canal crisis began. And after that, he returned to Agence France Press in London for six years before getting transferred to Paris. A few months later, in 1960, he won the coveted New York assignment. He was not yet 30 years old. Guillard came to Oxford with a photographer, Sammy Shul Shulman, also of AFP. As they were pulling into Oxford, they heard President Kennedy's speech about Ole Miss and thought that all would be calm. Oh, hell, the story's all over, Guillard told Shulman, but we might as well go and clean it up. A few minutes later, they walked on campus and realized the riot was in full swing. Shulman saw Guillard walk toward the surging mob and become absorbed in its mass, in the darkness, in the clouds of tear gas, in the hysteria. But none of those among us uh, that I know of, and certainly not this reporter, had any idea that the events that were to unfold here would turn out to be as important, as historic, as history changing as they proved to be. On September 30, 1962, the fires of hate spread out of control here in Mississippi and unfortunately on this campus. There were many unfortunately, state leaders. Talk about people who kind of stirred this up. State leaders and segregationists who helped fuel the rage. Uh, some of them were from out of state and uh, a lot of them were not. But that led to 30 federal marshals being shot on this campus. Another 136 being injured. 48 soldiers were also injured. This was 
more than just a riot, really. Um, but their mission was to protect the university's lone African-American student, James Meredith. On that evening, someone fired a gun into the back of reporter Paul Guillard, and his killers left him for dead, you know, hoping to kill him, you know, keep him from sharing the truth. But death failed to silence that reporter. He reported for a French press agency, and his words were still printed, including his observation that the most serious constitutional crisis ever experienced by the United States since the War of Secession had taken place right here at Ole Miss. The thing to remember, I think, is that freedom of the press is far from a privilege granted to a fortunate few. It is a sacred right given to all Americans. Throughout the centuries, freedom of the press has helped safeguard this nation from tyranny, from repression, and from those in government who scheme to keep us in the dark. We must not let this moment pass without noting that those involved in killing Paul Guillard walked free that day. They executed this international journalist within a half mile of hundreds of lawmen, scores of other reporters, and more than 2,000 students and civilians. Somebody alive knows what happened. Somebody alive holds clues to solving this senseless murder. And somebody alive may have even pulled the trigger, living with guilt ever since. It is never too late to do the right thing, as we see here on this campus and throughout Mississippi. It is never too late to find forgiveness. And it is never, ever too late to tell the truth. In 2010, the National Society of Professional Journalists named the Ole Miss campus a National Historic Site in Journalism in honor of French reporter Paul Guillard and the 300 plus reporters who covered the 1962 integration crisis. Welcome tonight. My name is Doug Sullivan Gonzalez. I'm going to be the moderator for these two powerful two. I'm going to just open it up, let you guys take off cat reaction and or or give some insight. Okay, thank you, Doug. And I'm certainly excited and just honored to be here, uh, Kathleen, and to talk about uh, this particular book. And let me just warn the audience before we uh, get started: if you have or have not read the uh, book. You will not be able to put it down if you start. <laughs> That's personal. I know that part. So I've thoroughly uh, enjoyed it. Yeah, and um, much had been written about the uh, crisis in 1962. Uh, but from your uh, perspective, what was really the inspiration to write this book? What's the motivation? During the university's 40th celebration, I read William Doyle's book, An American Insurrection. And in that book, there's only maybe a chapter devoted to Paul's death. I'm a journalist. I was a reporter for 10 years. I was outraged by that because I remember, if I'm, I remember when I was a young reporter, a reporter by the name of Don Bowles was murdered in Phoenix. And news editor Bob Green rallied reporters from around the country to go to Phoenix to find out to, one who killed him and two to finish reporting the story. And I thought that's the way the death of a reporter ought to be treated, not dismissed with one or two paragraphs. And in other books, he was never even named. I got mad. 
<laughs> okay. The book does much to point out certainly the severity of what was happening on campus as well. But I think I was a little surprised at the number of reporters that were on campus and the various places that they had uh, that they'd come from. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and in every uh, venue that you could mention, radio, television, uh, et cetera. And also, I was a little surprised to find out that there were probably some African-American reporters uh, as, uh, as well. And so uh, uh, I know that uh, a book like Dux took years of work uh, in terms of uh, research. But what, what's a few of the things that, uh, as you were researching, that even surprised you? Oh, even surprised? Well, certainly mm -hmm. the fact that there were uh, close to 300 or more than 300 reporters who came from around the world. But on reflection, um, I, I knew or became aware that the rest of the world was looking at the U.S. as to see how we solved our race problem. Because if we were advocating for democracy around the world and we were denying basic civil rights to a significant portion of our population, it called into question our commitment to democracy around the world. Okay. And uh, with that 300-plus uh, reporters, somehow this book highlights 12. Yes. When searching for 12 reporters, actually I probably have files on 100 of them, but I had to pull it down and to create a narrative. Who are the reporters who could contribute the most to the narrative? I wanted to interview them, so then I had to deal with those who I could locate after 50 years were alive after 50 years. If you figured they were 30 in 1962, many of them were no longer with us. And if they, if they weren't alive, I still had people who I wanted to include, so I had to find other research material that could tell their story. And that's one reason why Jimmy Hicks didn't make it, but Moses Newsom did. Because mm. there were no files on Jimmy Hicks, but Moses Newsom, who was the um, editor of the Baltimore Afro-American, was not only alive, but willing to be interviewed, and healthy enough to be interviewed. OK. Uh, how long of a process was this? Five, five years. Oh, five little Five years years until the publisher <laughs> said, thou shalt not touch this manu manuscript one more time. <laughs> And then it took That's a okay. year from that point to get to where we are today. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, did, did you consider the book finished or did you just stop? I stopped. Okay. <laughs> okay. Because, oh, because this is what, why I just stopped. We were in Jackson last week at Lemuria and two men came up to me and they said, we were there in 1962. Right. Oh, yeah. We think that we jumped over Paul's body. Oh, goodness. Oh, goodness. Really? Yes, we, we were running from the tear gas, and we saw a body on the ground, and we thought he was just drunk. So we just kept on running. Oh. May I have your contact information, please? <laughs> <laughs> and, and so this, the book is done, but the story's not over. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems as if it's a uh, book that every student of journalism at this university should, should read. It has so much information in it, and it talks about the role of, uh, of journalists as well. And I think uh, I knew a lot about the role that the federal marshals had played, the role that several go, uh, state elected officials had played, national uh, officials. But I hadn't thought much about in terms of uh, the role that journalists uh, has played. Uh, and so, uh, when, uh, when, when a journalist reads this, what would you like for them to take away? Pride. Pride in that no matter what it takes, we will get the story. And pride that this is, this is how journalists function. I was watching the Vietnam series this week, and the one, I think it was um, Sunday night's um, segment with the Battle of um, Way, and they you could see the reporters covering the story in the middle of this climatic te offensive battle. And I said, that's us. It doesn't matter. We're going to get the story. Mm -hmm. For the public, we will always get the story. Yes. Uh, and and uh, I think it was remarked that no one really knew the magnitude of the situation at the time. 
or that this would become such a um, classic event that happened on the campus of the University of, uh, of Mississippi. Uh, and I would think that um, everybody, both sides, would certainly want their story told. So why were reporters somehow not liked so much? Well, we know that people don't always like their side to be told. They prefer <laughs> the darkness, and we bring in the light. And if you're beating people up and you're doing bad things, you don't want to see your picture in the newspaper the next day. You have to remember also for, for the audience in that um, it was all print newspaper. Television um, was not available in all 48 contiguous states until the next year. Network television was not available. Television was in its infancy, which is also what brought the networks there because they recognized that this had great visual elements and that would be good to, um, television desperately wanted to be treated um, with the same respect that print had and they had to find stories that would enable them to outdo newspapers. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I take it that you, aside from the archives, that you actually had opportunity to actually talk with some of these uh, reporters as well. Which one did, has stories that, that really moved you? Oh, <laughs> it's, it's sort of like, sort of like when you're, you're a child and you're playing with your dollhouse and it's like, I'm going to spend today with Dorothy and I would, Dorothy would be my best friend for a whole week because I was writing Dorothy's story. Or I'm going to talk with Claude because Claude's my favorite one. They're all my favorites. Um, they're all my children. <laughs> you know, I have their pictures out there. Some of the stories were very poignant, though. Um, Dorothy Gilliam was the first African-American woman hired by the Washington Post. She started her career in Memphis, where she was born at the Tri-State Defender. She had covered Little Rock. She had gone on. Um, to get a master's degree from Columbia, was hired by the Post, and got married two weeks before the riot. And her boss said, you can't go. She goes, I want to go. It's a story. And he said, it's not safe. He let her go at the end of the week because, as we all know from watching the news, just look at our hurricane coverage, a week later, we have f different reporters covering the story. So she gets to Memphis, and uh, she's worried. It's a segregated society. There are only three hotels in Oxford. There are over 300 reporters, FBI agents, US Marshals, government officials. In other words, no place to stay. And she talked to her photographer, Ernest Withers. And, and Ernest said, don't worry, Dorothy. Don't worry. I'll find you a nice, quiet, safe t place to stay. You know, and Dorothy's a little, little nervous. Well, he did a black funeral home, <laughs> which sounds awful. But what I learned from this is that when, um, when African Americans traveled through the segregated South, the black community found ways to take care of them so that they had a safe place to um, sleep and they arranged for food but since they couldn't go to various restaurants. So Dorothy had to deal with that. And that was a shocker to me. Hmm, OK. Five years in the makings. Name me um, one or two times of which you were working on this and tears popped up in your eyes. Oh, well, I interviewed Claude Sitton before his death. So certainly when he passed, that was a very sad day because I went like, Claude, he's my friend. Um, when uh, Jimmy Hicks, who was with the Amsterdam News in New York and uh, Moses Newsom, who was with the Afro-American um, newspaper, two highly regarded black reporters who had been on the Freedom Rides and at Emmett Till. They were told by the police chief of Oxford that they were not allowed on campus. Mm -hmm. And um, because of their race. At that time, there was no riot. And that led, I discovered that through a telegram. This was, you asked about the archives. The library archives has a telegram collection before we had cell phones and computers, <laughs> we had telegrams and long distance operators, of which there were few and far between. The Western Union office here in Oxford donated all of the rough drafts of the stories to the archives. 
And in doing some initial research, I came across this, this treasure trove of telegrams. And I, I had first done a, um, an academic article on Paul. And I remember I was talking to Dean Norton about my research. And I told him about the telegrams. And he said, I, said, I don't know what to do with it. And he said, write a book. <laughs> so I did. And it took five years, but I, but I wrote the book. I have, a, I have a question, if you don't mind uh, jumping in. Um, I, I can't get out of my mind that the narrator, one of the people speaking in the film, said, someone alive knows what happened. Yes. Uh -huh. Still believe that? Yes. I do not believe that you can shoot somebody from a foot away and not tell your buddies that you had done it. Do we have any hard evidence of where to ask the next question? We, I think Jerry Mitchell and I are convinced that the more we talk about it, that there might be a deathbed confession or somebody's family member will tell us that that was their relative. Um, you never know who's going to come out of the woodwork, so to speak. A few years ago, I teach a class called The Press in the South, and I had a, I think she was Ross Barnett's great niece. I was a little worried talking about these issues in class. And she said, no, my branch of the family does not talk to that branch of the family. <laughs> <laughs> and she was great in the class. So yes, I believe that we will someday know the answer. Mm -hmm. While we're on that uh, subject, going down that street, let's talk about Paul for, for a while. What, uh, what did you learn about him? I learned a lot, because a year ago, I went to France and I interviewed his brother in the hometown, in the town where they grew up. It's St. Malo in Brittany. It's on the English Channel. During World War II, St. Malo was under German occupation for almost the entire war. Paul and his brother, who was, I think, eight years younger, were sent to St. Malo to live with their grandparents because their parents were working in London. And in 1939, they fought the countryside of France was a lot safer than London at the time. So when you walk the ramparts and the beach in the town of St. Malo, and you imagine a 10-year-old boy exploring in the way that 10-year-old boys love to explore, you can, see, you can see his imagination growing and wanting to know what was outside and what was the truth versus the German propaganda. And I, and when I stood there on the beach, even though you can't see England, technically, in your mind you could see England, and you're wondering about your family. And that, I think, fueled his natural talent um, to write, because he started a satirical journal in um, elementary school. Mm. He got him in hot water, too. But. <laughs> so good. Were, were, were there any uh, difficult conversations? I mean, uh, you know, in particular, um, uh, did, did he have any envy in his heart that you could pick up? Or, uh, no, he, he wanted to resigned? be a writer. And he became a journalist uh, to be a writer. He wrote plays and had one um, produced in New York. Hmm. So like many writers, they need a full paying job in order to <laughs> you know, pay the bills. So he wrote and did copy editing during the day and worked on his own <laughs> fiction at night. Hmm. OK, OK. Uh, and um, had you had the opportunity to meet any other family members? No, only his brother. Um, I did meet a childhood friend who they had grown up together at, um, and went to school together. Um, and he recently passed. Um, again, mm. age is mm. taking it away. And his brother no longer lived in St. Mallow. He lived about 200 miles away, but came up to um, spend three days with us walking. Okay. Visiting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are you all still in touch, Bible? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. okay. I have a new family member. <laughs> have they ever visited here? Not that I know of. Okay. No. Mm. For whatever reason. Um, I have to talk to the dean about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Yeah, maybe we can arrange a visit or uh, yeah. something of that. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and even your even yourself in terms of. Uh, representing the University of Mississippi to 
to that family or whatever? What, what kind of feelings that, that that invoke within you? Well, um, when we visited um, Paul's grave where he was buried, which actually is what helped me track down Paul um, back up, he said that we are all, France and the U.S. are always connected because of the sacrifice that Paul made, mm. and that Mississippi is, will always be part of St. Malo. Oh. Mm -hmm. yeah, that we have that connection. Okay. Uh, and um, of the uh, 12, there was also some other uh, reporters that you had mentioned in the uh, book as well that's one a member of the original uh, 12. Uh, what, what sort of singled them out as, as, as worthy? Each of worthy. their contributions? Well, we saw mm -hmm. Fred Powledge here, and Fred Powledge was working um, up north when the Civil Rights um, Movement began. You don't know it's a movement until it's over with. And Fred decided he had to come back to uh, the South. It was his people, and he had to be the one reporting the story. And now the clip that you saw was from a conference held here in 1987, National Civil Rights Conference. And the School of Journalism and Center for Southern Studies and a few other groups on campus brought back some 50 reporters who had covered the civil rights era and over the course of three or four days discussed the, re the reporting of um, the, during the civil rights era. So that, and I, I guess I have to add that for a very long time, the transcripts were lost. Mm -hmm. I had the transcripts. I didn't steal them. <laughs> <laughs> I tracked them down at Baylor University, who conducted the oral interviews, mm. and we, and they gave them all to me. And in two weeks, they're going back to the archives when I do a program over there. Very much. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is uh, is much at all known about Ray Gunner? About who? About Ray Ray Gun Gunter. No. Um, I'm, except that his first child was born a week later. He's the other man who was killed on campus. He was standing uh, by the Hill Guard Bridge, and he was shot. And they determined, as Fresenic scientists can do, that it, was, it came from a long distance. There were snipers on the roof. They were just shooting. And he came down, supposedly, to just see what was going on. Mm -hmm. Okay. If, if, if somehow this case, Paul's case, was somehow uh, solved within your lifetime. How would you feel? I would be thrilled. I would be thrilled. Mm -hmm. I come from a long living family, so. You know, I truly believe that you don't shoot someone and not tell somebody else. You know, in fact, the two guys who I spoke to down in Jackson were roommates, and they came together to the program. So they both knew well, they were running from the terror gas, they said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe they were throwing things. Mm -hmm. And do, during this time, and these were all different type reporters, but you know, when we mentioned the names Bob Schieffer, we mentioned the name Dan Rathers, et cetera. And I'll age myself a little bit because reporters don't get any bigger than that. I don't know who's reporting on CNN, who's reporting on Fox News or any other channels, but, but they don't get any bigger than, uh, than that. And so um, uh, I see that where they had made contributions to the, uh, to, to the book. And have you developed any relationship with them as a result of, uh, of your book? Well, Dan called me last week. Oh, <laughs> excuse me. To say he liked the book, <laughs> okay. and he, you saw him when he came for the, um, the plaque dedication. That came about because I was looking through my list of names, and um, I said, well, I know where Dan Rather works now, and I just picked up the phone and called him. And two months later, like three weeks before the program, I'm in the, this is pitiful, it really was. I was in the office at 5.30 on a Friday afternoon and the phone rings. I got, I'm not gonna answer it. I'm sorry, you know, but you know, phone rings, so I answered it. Hello, will you hold for Dan Rather? <laughs> okay, hi, this is Dan Rather. My schedule has cleared. I'd like to come for your program. Okay, we're on. And, and sometimes, you know, you just make a phone call and you never know who's going to 
say yes. Oh. <laughs> Never know. Yeah. Uh, was there any feel of any reporters um, invoking ill feelings about Mississippi or about the University of Mississippi? Or well, Bob, yeah. well, Bob Schieffer says that even though he reported in Vietnam, he, this was scarier than reporting in Vietnam. And they all have, I don't want to say fond memories, because it's hard to have fond memories of covering a riot. But what struck me is that when I interviewed them, they knew exactly what hotel they stayed at. They knew the restaurants they ate at. Uh, Carl Fleming, um, who has passed, but I found in his, in his book what he ate for breakfast. And it was filled with such crystal clear detail that this was a climatic event in their lives. They spent, it went over for 18 months, but that last weekend has been seared into their memory all these years later. Did, did any, just curious, did any experience the 2008 debate here with Barack Bob Obama? Bob Schieffer was here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason I asked Dan Rather, we could say because Rather came before Schieffer, I'm going down the list, but Schieffer uh, was only listed as working well, if his name was on the list, I actually can't remember now, but he was um, working for a radio station. And um, I don't know if I didn't pick up on his name or who knows, I can't remember how, how I made that decision. The list, you should ask me about the list. Let me ask you about the list. Well, hey, okay. Tell me how about do the I list. know there are 300? <laughs> well, because the University Publicity Office, Public Relations Office, had the reporters sign in and get credentials. Mm. And there are 279 names on that list. And I figure, well, not all reporters <laughs> are responsible and sign in. <laughs> so I feel fairly safe saying over 300. This list then came part of the Department of Justice file on the riot. And I requested through the Freedom of Information Act the James Meredith file. It came to me on a nice CD of some like 2,000 pages. In my office, it's in a binder this thick with all sorts of colored tabs on it, of which I forget what each color means at this point. And there, going through the file, I had a list of hmm. 279 names. Like now, the reporters learned very quickly when the riot broke out to rip off those credentials <laughs> because that was saying, Shoot me. Mm. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, it's okay. Um, and, you know, um, when these things first happen, they'll probably call them a uh, disturbance or whatever. And so when did it become clear to most reporters that this was just a little bit more than a disturbance? I think when they were getting beaten. Okay, <laughs> I think that would do. <laughs> I mean, back then, broadcast reporters, you had um, a camera, you had a sound person, you had a camera person, and you had a reporter. So you're moving in groups of four. You want to interview somebody, you pop up those lights, and you're just mm. announced who you were. Now, the print reporters took off their ties and, and tried to, the young ones dressed like students, and um, you know, tried to go um, not be so obvious, but that was not a guarantee of safety for any of them. Mm -hmm. uh, and one report I read, I'm thinking that he perhaps had his wife with him or something. That was Yoder, who we saw up there. Mm -hmm. um, Gordon Yoder was a videographer from Texas. His wife came with him. She was actually from Jackson, Mississippi. And like um, so many people, when you're hauling, stuff around. The goal was that she was going to drop her husband off in the circle and go find a place to park the car. When they paused on the circle, the mob surrounded the car, was shaking it, and got so irate, they tried to pull Mrs. Yoder out of the car, calling her a northern fill-in-the-blank with the rest of the obscenities. And she kept saying, I'm from Jackson. And the state police were going, yeah, well, OK, you know. And reporters came to the raid. Okay. Tell us a little about uh, Miss Brower as, 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 as the Mississippian reporter. Senator Miss Brower. Mm -hmm. This is especially for my students. She was the editor of the Daily Mississippian. She was a senior. She had been elected in a campus-wide election, which was the way it was done back then. 
and she was from Memphis. And Sidna wrote editorials that basically called for calm. We followed the law. She took no position on segregation, but she was outraged that she saw her campus exploding into tear gas and burned out cars. For that, her sorority sisters spit on her when she went back to her dorm. See, she was censured with a U by ASB, and that stood for 40 years until it was, uh, by vote of the ASB, uh, withdrawn with apologies. Um, let me see, one, two, what is the, there's a third thing I always can't, can't, oh, she was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. She did not win, mm. and what Sidney said, thank goodness, if I won it at 20, what more would I have to look forward to? <laughs> but she was brave, oh, I know the other one, the State Sovereignty Commission, which was the state investigatory agency, launched an investigation into Sidna and her views. They hauled her out of a history class, took her over to the Alumni Center, and she said, there I was, 20 years old, and there were three old men there. <laughs> I was by myself. It didn't even occur to me that maybe I should take a friend. And they questioned everything. And she went back to take her history exam. Well, you're a history professor, and then what he said? <laughs> no, you have to take another exam. Oh, that was history professor. Yeah, and, and so she did. But she went on, she um, was awarded several um, major journalistic type prizes, went into public relations, and then bought a weekly newspaper in New Jersey, which she operated for many, many years. So she never really left journalism. Yeah. Uh, and what's her feelings about UM now? She comes back frequently, mm -hmm. she, and she donated all her, her files. She was a little bit of everything, including what she described as the garbage sacks of letters and telegrams that she received from around the country, most of them not saying very nice things. They were all over at the archives. She saved every single one of them. She said her plan was to write a book, and then at one point she said, I'm never going to write a book. And so she's thrilled that um, her story has now been told. Mm -hmm. shall, we, shall we turn to the audience for some questions? You have a couple more questions? Yeah. Uh, just, I'll just do a last one. Just uh, react to this statement. How typical was it for uh, reporters in general to feel this way? I just, this is one, one of the quotes out of the uh, book. I was not aware that I was covering a seminal period in American history. I was doing it story by story. Well, I, I think it's very true from, from a lot of the reading I have done um, in related to uh, media coverage of civil rights. It is a story by story. You don't know it's a movement until you look back. First, it's an isolated event. It's Till. That was a singular event. Then it's the Freedom Rides. Then it's Ole Miss. Then it's Alabama. And then you look back and it gets labeled a movement. It was just the best story you could cover back then. <laughs> and this, like this last month, um, there was a story on the paper last night of a gal who was on the last plane to, I think it was Puerto Rico, and on the first plane out. And, um, and I said, that would have, would have been me when I was a reporter. Mm. It's where the news is, and I want to be there. Mm. <laughs> yeah, too, huh? The news is I want to be there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, Doug. Well, yes. thank you very much. We'll turn to the audience. If you have a, a question, a, a brief, succinct question, you could direct to Kathleen. Yes, back row. So, um, even though there's different issues, and we're all looking at something like what we can do about racism, and we're all looking at something like what we can do about racism, and we're all looking at something like what we can do about racism, and we're all looking at something like what we can do about racism, and we're all looking at something like what we can do about racism, and we're all looking at something like what we can do about racism, and we're all looking at something like what we can do about racism, and we're all looking at something like what we can do about racism, and we're all looking at something like what we can do about racism, and we're all looking at something like what we can do about racism, and we're all looking at something like what we can do about racism, and we're all looking at something like what we can do about racism, and we're all looking at something like what we can do about racism, and we're all looking at something like what we can do about racism, and we're all looking at something like what we can do about racism, and we're all looking at something like what we can do about racism, and we're all looking at something like what we can do about racism, and we're all looking at something like what we can do about racism, and we're all looking at something like what we can do about racism, and we're all looking at something like what we can do about racism, and we're all looking at something like what we can do about racism, and we're all looking at something like what we can do about racism, and we're all looking at something like what we can do about racism, and we're all looking at something like what we can do about racism, and we're all looking at something like what we can do about racism, and we're all looking at something like what we can do about racism, and we're all looking at something like what we can do about racism, and we're all looking at something like what we can do about racism, and we're all looking at something like what we can do about racism, and we're all looking at something like what we can do about racism, and we're all looking at something like what we can do about racism, and we're all looking at something like what we can do about racism, and we're all looking at something like what we can do about racism, and we're all looking at something like what we can do about racism, and we're all looking at something like what we can do about racism, and we're all looking at something like what we can do about racism, and we're all looking at something like what we can do about racism, and we're all looking at something like what we can do about racism, and we're all looking at something like what we can do about racism, and we're all looking at something like what we can do about rac
friends get into a dangerous situation. You're going to alert them. You'll be competitive on the story, but you actually do share information when you're on the job. And the reporters, do you know the story of the reporter's notebooks? I don't have one with me. I wish I did. That is, our reporter's notebooks are half size. Mm -hmm. They were invented here in Mississippi <laughs> by Claude Sitton and Carl Fleming, who were covering civil, mm. <laughs> civil rights events. And up to that point, they used steno books, which are this wide. Well, at one point, Claude said, this isn't going to work. And he ripped his notebook in half so that he could stick it in his coat pocket. Mm -hmm. Because back then, reporters all wore coats and ties, male reporters. <laughs> and so that way, he would have some anonymity covering the story. And then he went back to Atlanta and got a stationery store to make them. <laughs> so that's a Mississippi invention. That's a, that's a good question. We appreciate that question. Yes. There were many, I'm sure, who were working as stringers, including Ed Meek, <laughs> who um, was a graduate student. And he not only took many of the photographs that I used in the book, but Ed was um, multi multitasking in that he was writing similar stories from multiple newspapers at the same time. And I suspect he was not the only man or the only person who was doing that. And I didn't say anything in the archives. But see, they could be professional reporters now, and I wouldn't I hear from them. I hope so. I would like to know their experiences. Yes. So just bring it back to Paul again, because I'm fascinated. What, which law enforcement agencies investigated his death? Was there a real investigation at the time? <coughs> Proper scrutiny was not applied. There was a grand jury who was convened, and they basically said, well, if James <clears throat> Meredith hadn't come to campus, there wouldn't have been a riot, and therefore, he wouldn't have gotten murdered. So there. Now, you go, what? <clears throat> you know, that was it? Yeah, that was it. But there was no suspect for them to? They didn't try very hard. I mean, uh, there were allegations, someone in white, a kitchen worker or a sailor. There were allegations, maybe this person or that. I talked to a woman who said she was walking back to her dorm. Where he was murdered was in the bushes near what was Ward Dormitory. Student Union is currently on top of that uh, footscape there, so that becomes a problem. But I talked to a woman who said that she saw some people over there smashing a camera near what she thought was a body. And Evans Thomas, who was RFK's biographer, says that he came to the conclusion that Paul saw members of the KKK unloading rifles near the parking area by Ward Hall. Long place, long time. Hard to say, but no. He was a Frenchman. He wasn't local. And his fam I asked his brother, well, what did your parents do? I mean, today we'd have a social media campaign. And they were in France. And they basically accepted, just accepted it. They didn't, hmm. there were no massive campaigns like we see today for if something like that were to happen. Yes. With what the his body, the location? You know, did they investigate any pictures from his camera? Oh no, this is it. No FBI investigation. Well, not really. No, because <laughs> there was no federal um, law uh, for murder at the time, so it was not an FBI uh, job. There's no, they had no jurisdiction. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, 
not that I was able to tell, and since Jimmy Hicks and uh, Moses Newsom were barred from campus, I believe that would have probably been a universal barrier. Yeah. But I included two in the book because their stories also tell a lot about what was happening in Mississippi at the time. I did not recognize any publications from the list as being African American publications. And, and those uh, the <coughs> African Americans, they interviewed quite a few people in the community. They did. They did. In fact, that was um, really what uh, Dorothy Gill Gilliam's job was, was to talk to the African American community and find out how they felt. They were scared. They were scared the whole time. I talked to a woman by the name of Effie Burr, and some of you may know Effie because she sings in town. And um, Effie was only a small child, and she said that uh, they were terrified to go to the grocery store in Oxford. They would go to Water Valley or Batesville, and they would, um, her father was involved in the NAACP, and they had a telephone system to alert the black community when it was safe or not safe to go to uh, various locations. Yeah, so, and, but there was very little coverage of the black community. Um, I have a question. Tell us about how the memorial for Paul came about. Ah, I was the student advisor for the um, Society of Professional Journalists. And um, well, when I get, get enthused, my students, I hope, get enthused. So we applied for and uh, received a grant to p for the installation of a memorial bench um, in memory of Paul, which stands, it looks, overlooks Sorority Row. And we chose that location for several reasons. Since the spot where he died was no longer available, there went that. A sorority put a, a meditation circle next to the spot. Mm -hmm. And then we said, well, if Paul had been al alive at 3 a.m. when the troops came marching up Sorority Row, he would have been there. So we chose that spot in the L form uh, there by the Journalism School and the Honors College. Has the bench stood the test of time? Has been any vandalism? Oh, yes. In fact, you found one of my plaques in the bushes, I heard. <laughs> That's right. That's what I'm asking. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've had, we've replaced the memorial plaque um, twice. And the last time we got a really good bolt, and it's it stayed. <laughs> so we don't know how or why the other one plaques disappeared, but you found the second one and tossed in the bushes. Has the bench itself been moved or damaged? No, okay, just never. the plaque itself. Just the plaque. And okay, was there a memorial? The memorial you were standing by, that is still. That's out front. Now we actually have two of the historical designation plaques. The first one is in our lobby, and um, that's the program where um, Dan Rather and Jerry Mitchell came. And then Dean, Dean Norton decided we needed a plaque outside. So we had another plaque dedication outside, and John Siegenthaler came for that one. Uh -huh. And every time you know, I'll be out riding my bike or being on the weekend, there'll be people looking at the outside plaque, so that was a good choice. Mm -hmm. And I always want to go up to them and go, you want no more? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, what percentage of the archive did you, do you feel like you've covered? Most of them, or, or is it still much there? Oh, there's still, oh yeah. The archives, you have um, multiple uh, people have donated the material from William Doyle and Russell Barrett and Sidna and in addition, I went to archives at Emory, um, Harvard, Columbia University, the New York Public Library, um, and of course the National Archives, which was kind of fun. The Southeast Regional National Archives outside of Atlanta is where the U.S. Marshals files are stored. So I go, I call them up, I track them down, and I go visit them, and they go, nobody has ever looked at these files. <laughs> okay. Mm. And so I sp spend my time there, and I left behind in the folders little blue colored pieces of paper for when I came back. It took me about three or four years to get back. 
Because <laughs> I initially just did an academic article. And guess what? My little blue it's pieces still, of paper were still there. Still there. No one had touched it in the interim. So those were files that people had never seen. Mm -hmm. Happened to be old Miss Cullis. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Questions? There's got to be more. You're journalist students. Mm -hmm. These oh. lights are real bright on my glasses. I'm sorry, what about? Who came from the Delta Democrats? Nobody. That's not, that sounds like an indictment. But in reality, nobody knew that Mary was going to be brought to campus on Sunday afternoon. And so it was only those reporters who were in town who got to cover it. Um, the, the thought was that he was going to be brought to campus on Monday. And there were a lot of, uh, were there a lot of miscommunications because um, of that fact. So that's why a lot of the Mississippi papers um, were not here. And um, the reason they didn't do it on Sunday is because, I'm pulling the total blank on the, on the school official's name, who said, you cannot register Meredith on Sunday. That would desecrate the Sabbath. <laughs> they did register him, right? No, Monday morning, Monday 8 o'clock. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. So they did it Monday morning at 8 o'clock. And the reason the marshals ended up around the Lyceum is because Kassenbach said, I've got all these marshals here. Meredith is in his dorm, which is Baxter Hall, which is up there by the water tower. And Katzenbach said, what am I going to do with these guys? Oh, we'll put them around the administration building. Nobody will care about that. <laughs> well, and, and there were a couple other stories like that that I found that we know an army, an army moves on a couple things, obviously men and weapons. But they also move. They need food communications, and um, medical care. They didn't have any. Well, eventually, they got some watery tomato soup, I gather, in there. Eventually, oh. the town doctor, the university doctor, was recruited to come. And as for communications, well, it went like this. They wanted to call the White House, and they didn't want to go through, use the university phones. They wanted privacy. So tell me, Don, do you got a dime in your pocket? Uh, yes. Oh. Into a payphone. There were four payphones in the Lyceum. They kept the line open, and that was their communication be. in the middle of a riot. OK. OK. Keep Don. There were, there were several names mentioned in the book uh, as well. Tell us a little bit about General Edwin Walker and Reverend Duncan Gray. I didn't do a lot about Walker, but Walker okay. uh, had led the troops in Little Rock, and he went on the radio and did a call to arms to segregationists across the South to come and defend the country, the country from federal intervention. And he came to Oxford, and he hung out at the Confederate statue calling for his people to rise up and to riot. Uh, eventually, he was arrested in charge of insurrection and taken to a mental health facility where RFK, I think, said he shall never again see the light of day. Hmm. He did get out. Neil Gregory of the Commercial Appeal covered his bond hearing when his mother pawned her jewelry to get him out of jail. Hmm. Uh, Neil Gregory was from the Commercial Appeal. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Reverend Gray? Uh, Reverend Gray, Reverend Duncan Gray from St. Peter's Episcopal Church also tried to get students to go home and to calm down. And he was a leader in the religious community throughout the months leading up to the riot, meeting with his fellow pastors and calling for calm and sensibility. And he is greatly remembered for taking that leadership role. Any concluding thoughts? Or? Let me ask maybe one more question. I'm, I'm sure that you debated the title quite a bit. Oh, yeah, we had multiple titles. Okay. <laughs> I mean, okay. Oh, um, I had a, t a working title, and then we thought we had a lead to another great title, and then we discovered that person said it didn't work. So, yeah, we had many titles. So, yeah, so Dean Norton on my activity report, it's all the same book. You know, there aren't five books out there. <laughs> Um, okay. But yeah, I had many working titles. Mm -hmm. And you sailed upon this one because? Because 
we thought we were immortal. When we go cover that hurricane, when we go to Charlottesville, we think nothing's going to happen to us. <coughs> but we're going to cover this story because it's our job as uh, the press to um, report on behalf of the public. And if that means that we have to be in a dangerous situation, we'll be c careful, but we're not going to stay home. We're not going to, no, we're going to do it. Any concluding thoughts? Oh, many concluding thoughts. I've done uh, two columns that have run in uh, different newspapers relating the events of 1962 to today. And the truth is the issues are still as stark as they were back then. Um, I think they went underground for a few years, but we are seeing some of the same issues um, manifested in, our, in the events that are occurring around the country from the Confederate statues to the rise of the um, neo-Nazis to whatever. And we are going to cover those stories no matter what it takes. Thank you very much, Kathleen. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Kwan.